O Lord, my strength, the Lord is my foundation and my refuge and my and Holy Spirit, Trinity, co-essential and undivided. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one true God. Greetings, everybody. God bless you. <clears throat> to all our faithful, wherever you are, whether you're in this country, because we have an internet that goes all around the world. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Yes, whether you're in this country or uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Africa, God have mercy. Australia even, God bless mm. those that we have in Australia that are looking towards us. Because why? Because we speak orthodoxy. <clears throat> People are searching and they should, they should search. And like Christ said, seek and you shall find. God will provide. It's the destiny of all, of all men, <clears throat> to come to the knowledge of the truth and to find the church and to be baptized. That's the destiny of all. God grant you all. Some people are born in the church, like myself. And I don't think there was even two or three minutes that, what, that I was outside the church. But people come and they find the truth and we open our arms and show, show love to them because they're fulfilling the will of God. And, you know, people thank me, thank you, <clears throat> because you've baptized me, you, you've enlightened me, and I say, well, this is why God keeps me alive. Mm -hmm because of people like you. Okay, so this is the 10th week, the 10th week after Pentecost. And we are in the Feast of the Dormition. It's August. And we are monastics from Mount Athos. We have our roots in Mount Athos. So we follow the tradition of Mount Athos. So, on Mount Athos, the Feast of the Dormition is kept for practically the whole month of August. Mm -hmm. So this coming Thursday, according to the Tipicon of probably all the other churches, I guess, they celebrate on Thursday the last feast feast day of the Dormition, but not us. We keep it for almost another week uh, to the day before the beheading of St. John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. But being in the feast, uh, we commemorate another icon, the icon of the dawn. Put that beautiful icon up. 
mm-hmm. of Mother of God of the Dawn. And today we celebrated the feast of the great martyr Andrew, the general, and the 2,593 martyrs with him. Okay. Andrew, named after, well, his name is the same as the Apostle Andrew, the first call, but uh, here's the, here's a little story about him, or a synopsis of his life. St. Andrew was an officer, a tribune in the Roman army, in the time of the Emperor Maximian. There are so many Christians that were in the army of the Romans. Mm -hmm. Who's the biggest one that you know, Vedika? St. George. St. George, right. Uh, And there were secret Christians. Well, St. Andrew, he was a Syrian by birth. So he's a compatriot to me. So that's nice. His feast is is during the Domitian, during the Mother of God's uh, feast day. And he served uh, in his native land when the Persians attacked the Imperial Roman army. This Andrew was entrusted with the command in the battle against the enemies whence his title is called the commander or general. A secret Christian, though, although yet as yet unbaptized. Mm -hmm. Now, this is dangerous. You're you're not baptized yet, and then you're going to go into battle. St. Andrew commended himself to the living God and taking only the cream of the army he went to war he must have picked the best soldiers you remember when Gideon he took the best in the Old Testament he took the best soldiers to go to battle against the Philistines I think and how did he how did he discern the best soldiers? It's when they came to water, he saw how they drank, how they drank from the stream or something. And the ones who put their heads down and didn't keep their attention in front of them, He said, okay, you could go home. But the ones who took the water and brought it it to their mouths so they could see before them how they they were alert, those are the ones he picked. So here, Andrew, knowing his, his soldiers, picked the best, the cream of the army. Before the battle, he told his soldiers that if they all called upon the aid of the one, the one true God, Christ the Lord, their enemies would become as dust scattered before them. All the soldiers were fired with enthusiasm by Andrew and and his faith. And they all invoked Christ's aid and attacked. This is wonderful. The Persian army was utterly routed with the help of God, too. When the victorious Andrew returned to Antioch, he came as as a conqueror. They must have had a big parade for him. They threw rose petals in front of them and his army. Everybody was happy. 
But what happened? Some jealous men denounced him as a Christian. And the imperial governor summoned him for trial. Andrew openly proclaimed his steadfast faith in Christ. And why wouldn't he? He destroyed the Persian army with his army that called upon Christ. Bravo. So they, they put him in jail and were thinking of torturing him. They put him in prison. But the governor wrote the emperor in Rome, knowing St. Andrew's popularity among the people and in the army, the emperor and the governor ordered that Andrew be set free, but seek another occasion and another excuse, not his faith, to kill him. By God's revelation to St. Andrew, he knew what the imperial command was, and taking his faithful soldiers, all 2,593 in all. There must have been a great company of believing men. And why wouldn't they believe? Look what they did to the Persian army. Probably knowing that they had divine help. And he took them all and went off to Tarshish in Cilicia. He went up north, where they were all baptized by the Bishop Peter. So they got that which was necessary, baptism by water. But you should know that if they were killed or murdered because they were Christians, uh, they would still be accounted as martyrs in the Holy Church and in heaven. So persecuted here also the imperial might by, by the Roman imperial might Andrew and his companions withdrew deep into the Armenian mountains of Tavos, there in a ravine while they were at prayer. How wonderful. The Roman army came upon them and beheaded them all. I don't think they fought. Uh, they must have been given great grace. Not one of them would recant, all be, being determined on death by martyrdom for Christ. They must have had a glorious revelation from Christ of what is in store for them if they remain faithful. On that spot, <clears throat> they were all beheaded and the streams of their blood fell on the ground. And right from there sprung a healing spring, gushed forth and healed every disease. And Bishop Peter, I think uh, from the complete life of St. Andrew, Bishop Peter and some of his people beheld what happened to these uh, 2,593 holy soldiers and how they were beheaded. And they, they were in a secret place high up in the mountains where they could see what was going on. So that after the Roman army left, Peter and his people came and buried the martyrs in that same place. They all suffered with honor at the end of the third century and were crowned with wreaths of glory and entered into the kingdom of our Christ and God. Now, their place was made a shrine and their relics were preserved and by the mercy of God, 
by the goodwill of God. Their relics were brought to Byzantium. So the relics ended up in Cyprus. And at a monastery, a poor monastery, uh, that needed financial help. So they offered, they offered the relics of uh, St. Andrew. And by the mercy of God, we were able <clears throat> to receive them along with its unique relic worry. And so the relics came to America. They came to Division Skeet. And here is a picture of the skull of St. Andrew, the commander, who celebrates on August 19. That is today. Glory be to God. Okay, tomorrow is Monday, and it's the prophet Samuel put up an icon of some. Oh, did you put up an icon of St. Andrew? Mm -hmm. Very good fresco. We frescoed our church with the with the icon of St. Andrew years before we received the skull of St. Andrew. But it was very nice and very appropriate. <clears throat> so, the prophet Samuel is on Monday. Uh, the apostle of the 70, Thaddeus, is on Tuesday. Wednesday is a fast day. The icon of Mother God Perusiosi, Perusiosita. And the Virgin Mara Evlalia of Barcelona. Probably all Italians celebrate. The great Mara, Virgin Mara Evlalia. Okay, and then uh, Thursday is the Apodius, Apodesis, the leave taking of the Feast of the Domitian, according to those who celebrate or observe the Typicon of the Church, other than Almanatos. In other words, the, the Typicon is not a matter of dogma. It's the tradition of the Church. The tradition of the church can be modified by those in authority, like the bishop. Like if I wanted to proclaim a fast, which I've done in the past, for all our faithful to please fast for a particular reason to entreat Christ for mercy, mm -hmm. we can do it. The church will be feasting, but our people will be fasting because the bishop told them to fast. So, <clears throat> the calendar, when it was changed in 1920 by the Masonic uh, bishops in authority, uh, the fanatics of Greeks, of Greece, also known as the Matthewites, said, ah, you're a heretic. You're a heretic if you change the calendar. And everybody was telling these people, calm down, you are wrong. But they would not listen. So to change the faith, change the creed, then that's a heresy. But to change the tipicon, to change the calendar. And everybody was telling these people, calm down. <clears throat> no. So they broke away from the church. They broke away. They caused a schism. That is very bad. And they came to an evil end. They not only broke faith with the universal church, they started breaking all the canons. And they made their own can canons, and they broke them, too. They're called the Matthewites. Everybody should stay away from them. And uh, wasn't there some news lately about the Matthewites? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
And many bizarre things happen to them, uh, which shows that they are engulfed in demonic deception. Lately, I think it was lately, uh, but at least lately it was shown on the internet that a Matthew White bishop either was doing the liturgy or after the liturgy, he had the discourse. And the discourse in the liturgy has the lamb and the commemoration of the Virgin Mary and the, the 12 orders and the commemoration of living and the dead. Now, it's mysterious what actually happened it looks like the discus baked itself or fried what was on it. And perhaps, you know, we're trying to find out what exactly happened, but they don't tell you because it's so bizarre. Perhaps during the liturgy, he took off the veil and the star and he looked on the discus and it was an ugly mess. The discourse was ruined. So these mis this demonic uh, incidents, well, they said, wow, this shows that we are the true church because look what happened. And people <clears throat> would refrain from laughing um, and say, you people must be crazy. You were prevented from celebrating the liturgy, and now you say, this proves that you are the true church. And if you look at the picture, there it is, the picture, it's an ugly mess. Uh, things like that are not supposed to happen. But this is the Greek old calendars under the Matthewites. Now, where are we? Friday is St. Cosmas Atolos, mm -hmm. the equal to the apostles, and Saturday is the translation of the relics of St. Bartholomew and St. Titus. Okay, that rounds off this week. Now, this is the 10th, the 10th Sunday, and the epistle was uh, St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, I think that God showed us the apostles last. But, you know, in the kingdom, they're going to be the first. Mm -hmm. St. Paul says, I think that God showed forth us the apostles last. And I should put in parentheses, during this life. But in the life to come, they're going to be on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But in this life, St. Paul is saying, we are last, as condemned to death. And yes, we know all of them, by being apostles, is a condemnation to death because they imitated Christ. They embarked on a new way of life, not like they could ever imagine before they met Christ. They went out into the world <clears throat> on a mission to convert the world. For we became a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are held in honor, but we in dishonor. So we who were converted by them were honored. But they who converted us, dishonor was their lot. Mm -hmm. Until the present hour, we both hunger and thirst are naked and are being buffeted and never at rest. We, and we toil with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. 
And this is what we should do. If we are reviled, we should bless. Being persecuted, we bear up. This is what we should do if we are persecuted. We are, in many and various ways. Being evilly spoken of, we beseech. And this is what we should do. We become the filth of the world, the offscouring of all until now. And if we are like that, and many think that we are the filth of the world because we don't follow world orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Because in ecumenism, world orthodoxy, the patriarchates, they will love and show love and respect to the heretics by praying with them by honoring them, by visiting them, by mentioning them in the diptychs, praying for them, and at times even giving them communion. But the Orthodox, who don't agree with these people, we are the ones who they attack. We are the object of their maliciousness and slander but admonishing you as my beloved children. For if ye have myriad of tutors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I begot you through the gospel. Therefore, I beseech you, keep on becoming imitators of me. Yes. The holy apostles. Very good examples to imitate. Okay, the gospel for today. Matthew. Um, this is after Christ was transfigured on the mountain. And he came down. And this incident is recorded in three gospels, I think. And this is from Matthew. And there came to pass a certain man <clears throat> kneeling down to him say, uh, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and suffereth badly. For often he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples. And they, he says, he's blaming them. And they were not able to cure him. What is this person? He heard of all the miracles that Christ had made and the apostles had made. So now he brings his son, and I wonder what's in his heart uh, by saying, and they were not able to cure him. And Jesus answered and said, oh, unbelieving and wayward generation, because he knew what was in this person. Until when shall I be with you? Until when shall I bear, bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked it. And the demon came out of him. And the boy was cured from that hour. And another gospel gives more details. Because this father said, If you are able, if you are able, please help me. So he did not believe. <clears throat> there was an if there. So Christ, our loving Lord, uh, cured the boy. And he, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why were we not able to cast it out? We cast out many before him. <clears throat> this demon did not come out. And he said, because of unbelief. For verily I say to you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, move from here and go there, and it, should, and it shall move, and nothing shall, by, shall be impossible to you. But this type of demon, mm -hmm. with the father 
not believing, and who knows why the demon went in him. But this kind goeth out not except by prayer and fasting, which is very appropriate. Prayer and fasting is very powerful. And the, okay. And while they dwelt in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered up into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised. Hmm. While he dwelt in Galilee. It's amazing. God the Creator dwelt in Galilee. He became man. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it's beyond our understanding the great love that God has given showed us okay let's let's go to the full let's go to the philemata the kisses of Judas mm. in this wonderful book that documents the apostasy of our time and on page 239. Let's see what's on page 239. If there's any pictures. Thank you for Father Athanasius for translating this. And here it is. Top of the page. And it has some pictures of what we're going to tell you what happened. Metropolitan Kalinikos of Berias. And there's a his picture, he was made bishop in Perias in 1978. He retired in 2006, and he died in 2020. Metropolitan Kalinikos of Perias participates in Rotary Masonic gatherings. The organizational Metropolitan, quote unquote, Metropolitan of Perias, Kalinikos Carusos, of the new calendar, participates in Masonic gatherings, exclamation point. The Bulletin of the Rotary Club of Perias for July and August 1999 writes regarding the following, quote, at the festive gathering of July 6 at the Austere Palace Hotel in Vuliamini of the 247th Rotary District of George Vasilikotos, the Reverend, the very Reverend Father George Calamaris, was also present as representative, the official representative of His Eminence Metropolitan Kalinikos of Perias. Perias is the, is the port of Athens. The solemn gathering began with prayer. They have their own prayers, parentheses, to an indefinite God for all religions because... Followers of various religions participated in this gathering. So they had to have a prayer which did not specify what God they're praying to, which was read by the very Reverend George, Father George Calabrius. Kira Kalinikos is one who said, now this is the bishop, now the kiss of Judas is giving us a little background. This metropolitan Kalinikos of Perias is the one who said that he is willing to have his whole body sealed with the Antichrist number 666. Oh, How does a bishop talk like this? This Kalinikos is the one who was the first of the ecclesiastical communities to install a radio station in his metropolis in order to use it 
to do war against the orthodox old calendar movement of Greece. What do you know about that? See, with, with all other religions, they're okay. They'll pray with them. But against those who do not want to follow the Pope's calendar or separate because of ecumenism, uh, let's install a radio station so we could do war against these. And Metropolitan Callinicus tolerates the Church of Capsanos at Ophelirion to operate, to liturgize a shrine with a veil and without an iconostas. This Metropolitan Callinicus is the candidate for the Cathedra of Athens. He's a candidate to be elevated to, to be Metropolitan or Archbishop of Athens by preference of the, Mas of the Masons. Now, the Rotary Club. Maybe people don't understand. The Rotary Club has its origins in Masonry. That's why this guy who calls himself a Metropolitan is no problem in being with these people. The Rotary Club, in all their writings, has no reference to God. No reference to God. So therefore, well, it's like a magnet for atheists. Because you join a club, and you're an atheist, and you're so welcome at the Rotary Club. And they try to do good things, so they're looked upon as good people. But it's satanic. It's just like masonry. But it has its origins in masonry. So you should, no one should be uh, tricked in thinking, okay, it's good to go join this club. It's good to join this club. Well, when you rub an elbows and you're expected to be very close friends with fellow rotaricians, they call them. That could be very harmful for you spiritually. So I wanted to mention about the Rotary Club and these secret organizations. It seems that they are Gnostic in nature. They follow Gnosticism. What's Gnosticism? It's a $10 word that says very simply, they believe in a God that's not named. God could be anything. But they have secret, secret, that's the main thing for Gnostics, secret and mysterious rites, secret and mysterious prayers. It's a secret club. It's a secret, secret organization. That's why it dovetails so good with masonry. Some say the Masonic symbol with the square and the compass and the G inside stands for, doesn't stand for God, it stands for Gnostics. But even if it stands for God, it's a God that they make up. Or it's a, it's a pagan God which they don't want to name. So these secret ideas, these Gnostic revelations, uh, they are rejected by the church. We don't believe in this. The revelation of God 
has been made, the apostles have proclaimed once and for all the great preaching and revelation that God has given to us. We worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one true God. Nothing is hidden. We have a creed that everybody should know and believe. It's all open. We don't have the secret, Gnostic, mysterious, ooh, it gives you heebie-jeebies to think that there's some secret formula that if you join this club, oh, wow, you have it made. And this sounds like masonry, the Rotary Club, and all heretics. Well, they develop a secret understanding which they believe themselves, and they try to preach it. Well, where did this new invention come from? It comes from the devil. There's so many traps out there. So God, God help us that we don't fall into any of them. And so, okay, Archbishop Gregory, how do we know that some teaching, you may ask, is not right. Well, it's not that difficult. If it just popped up, then you know, where did this come from? Have we heard about it from the time of the apostles? Is there any connection whatsoever to the apostolic tradition? And the answer is, if the answer is no, then there's no reason to believe it. So give me an example, you say. Well, ecumenism, that's the biggest example. And everything that sprouts from ecumenists and ecumenism. Ecumenism is so bad, it takes the whole doctrine of orthodoxy, of the gospel. Where's the gospel? It takes the whole end of the rudder. It takes everything that's been written he in here for 2,000 years in the councils and the Holy Fathers, and all of a sudden just throws it right out the window. But they will still call themselves orthodox. What else can you say? Ah, yes, what comes from the ecumenists that don't make sense? The thing, the situation, the topic of toll houses. Toll houses. That when a person dies, they have this mysterious, gnostic, Revelation, the demons, ooh, that gives you heebie-jeebies. The demons are going to judge us, not our loving and almighty and forgiving Lord. It's the demons that are going to judge us. They're going to, they, they say there's a road, there's a road going someplace, <clears throat> And people make icons up because it's, 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 it's something new, it's a novelty, and it caught on, and people talk about it, but it has no basis at all in the scriptures and in the traditions of the church. This is all new. And who is pushing this thing? Well, lately, there's a monastery down in the state of Arizona, who printed a big book trying to prove that there is this new idea of toll houses. And so they, they try in many ways, 
and quote many people and show many icons. So when did this pop up? 100, 200, 300 years ago? 400 years ago, it popped up. I don't care when it popped up. If it's not part of the tradition of the church, it should not be believed in. And so you have ignorant iconographers who were commissioned or they got it in their head. Hey, let's make an icon of these toll houses. So how did this theory start? By a dream of one person, a lay person, Gregory, who's not considered a saint by the church, he had a dream of a woman, Theodora, and her elder Basil. So on the basis of one dream of one layman, this whole theory of toll houses came to be. Who else had a dream like this? Nobody. Nobody in the whole history of the church. So all of a sudden we have this dogma of toll houses and also no one who had after death experiences ever came back and said they went through toll houses. This fabrication has never been uh, confirmed by another dream. Can you imagine? When do we listen to dreams? When is that part of the tradition? When has that become a matter of faith? Dreams are dreams. The demons can make you feel that you are in heaven. After all, it's a dream. And they can make you feel that you are in hell. Because after all, it's a dream. So, what do the Holy Fathers teach us? They said, don't believe in dreams. Believe in the gospel. Believe in the writings of the Holy Fathers. And if your guardian angel will somehow, uh, I think in the Ladder of Divine Ascent, it says, only believe those dreams that foretell a punishment, a punishment for your sins. Then, okay, you can believe those dreams and it should scare you and you should change your way of life. But other than that, uh, be very careful of things like this. And there are other things that pop up in the church. That's why in our church and among all our faithful, <clears throat> you don't find icons of the toll houses. You don't find icons of God the Father. You don't find icons of the Holy Trinity. You don't find icons that are uncanonical, like whoever heard of making an icon of the invisible God. If he's invisible, how can you make an icon of him? So all of these things are corrupt influences from the West, from Roman Catholicism. And they, they filter into the East and they try, with the help of the devil, to to mess up the simple mind of a pure Orthodox Christian. That's what I think. So everybody should be careful. So why? Our Savior says, and let us not enter into temptation. So stay away from such people. Stay away from such people. Because you could be hurt. And because I didn't have much today, I opened the, um, the rudder of the Holy Orthodox Church, which the ecumenists don't like. Because it's canons. It's the canons.
canons of the church. And this so happened to be the 102 canons. The 102 canons was the canons of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Yes. The canons of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. And this so, this so happened, it came to canon number, this is in Old English, uh, 43. X-L-I-I-I. -I -I. 43. It is permissible for a Christian to choose the ascetic mode of life and abandoning the turbulent world of ordinary life to enter a monastery and to take a tonsure in accordance with the monastic habit, even though he should have been found guilty of any offense whatsoever. For our Savior God has said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. As therefore monastic life represents presents, represents to us a state of repentance as though engraved upon a pillar, we join in sympathizing with anyone that genuinely adopts it. And no manner of means shall prevent him from accomplishing his aim. So uh, the Holy Church is encouraging any and all to become a monastic, a true monastic. So in our times, these difficult times, when <clears throat> we don't have monasteries, we don't have convents, uh, what is a person supposed to do? The best he can, as long as he has someone to be under obedience to, who is in the church and who has experience. Because everybody, everybody must be under obedience. Then you will learn the spiritual life. Obedience is life. Disobedience is death. Now it's time to hear from St. John Kornstadt, My Life in Christ. It's time to hear from him. It's like he's talking to us, right? Great encouragement, consolation, and hope are afforded to those who pray by the following reassuring words of the Lord. Quote, ask, and it shall be given you, close quote. Further, quote, what man is there of you, whom, if his son asks bread, will give him a stone, close quote. If anyone asks me anything, and I, through evil and corrupt, though evil and corrupt by nature, Listen to his request, his words, moving my heart to compassion and help, and my hand to giving. Then will not my words, my most sincere prayer, move the fount of mercy, the lover of mankind, to have mercy upon me and help me? I, who am a sinner, but still his creature and the work of his hands. If earthly fathers are merciful, will not the heavenly Father be still more merciful? If I am merciful, will not God, the source of all mercy, be still more merciful? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Shall your Father, which is in the heavens, give good things to them that ask him? Let your faith and hope in God be strengthened by 
the earthly relations of fathers to their children. Yes, fathers must love and provide for their children. <clears throat> and our Heavenly Father will more so provide and protect his children, those who believe in him. Okay, the Philokalia now, <clears throat> on the Hesychastic way of life, by uh, St. Callistus. It is not possible to live the life of repentance without the followings of without following the way of stillness. Nor is it possible to attain any degree, any degree of purity without withdrawing from a life of worldly self-interest. Nor will we be granted the grace of contemplating God and of communing with Him so long as we spend our time meeting other people. Hey, that's just like what we were talking about earlier. I think meeting here other people are people that are not of our faith. For this reason, if we have made it our purpose to change our misguided manner of life and to purify ourselves from the passions, and in this way to enjoy the contemplation of God and communion with Him. For this is the aim and goal of all who live in accordance with God, and it is the foretaste, as it were, of our eternal inheritance and of God Himself. We should pursue stillness with all our strength and should strive to withdraw from the world and with the full dedication of our soul to shun the company of other people. Now, is this hard to accept? Well, if you're an Orthodox Christian, your life is hid in Christ. And the more you are alone with Christ, the better it is. That's why talkative, talkativeness is not good. <clears throat> Fellowship with unbelievers is not good, especially if they're not interested in any way. I want to mention on this past feast day of the Mother of God, uh, her Domitian, one of our servants of God in, in the Congo, his name is Felix, which is an Orthodox name. Uh, he reposed suddenly right on the feast of the Virgin Mary's Domitian. And he's married to the handmaid of God, Elizabeth, and they have five children. Oh. So now this family has been bereft of their father, um, their orphans, and his wife is now a widow. Um, here's a picture of them. Hmm. And uh, if anybody would like to donate to help this family survive, and now it is the responsible responsibility of the priest, their father Martin, uh, to take care to take care of this family. Uh, so, if anybody would like to help uh, this orphaned family, it would be very appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you for listening. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Mm -hmm.